the three major challenges to the implementation of the Right to Education uh, Act, uh, first off, is to elaborate the rules uh, in, in such a way that uh, the Act can actually be uh, operationalized and implemented. And I think that that has very major implications for both the government schools, which have a tremendous responsibility in implementing the Act in terms of the norms uh, that are specified in the schedule of the Act, and there are major implications for the private schools as well that uh, would be subject to this uh, clause stipulating that private schools need to uh, take in 25 uh, percent of, of their enrollment uh, from uh, weaker sections and disadvantaged groups in exchange for which they would be uh, reimbursed by the, by the government. So I think there are challenges for both the public and private schools. I think the challenges uh, for the government schools are going to be uh, how to uh, not only meet the pupil-teacher ratios that are specified at the school level, uh, but also to build up the capacity of the school management committees so that parents and community members are really able to exercise an academic monitoring role uh, and so that they are able to really promote the idea of learning as opposed to just access. So I think that's the challenge for the government schools. For the private schools, I think the challenge is going to be uh, how to meet the standards that are specified in the schedule of the Act uh, uh, and what that is going to imply in terms of the teacher salaries that they may have to pay. Uh, and uh, the facilities that are being offered. So I think there are challenges for both the public and private schools, but I think the challenges are a bit different. In my own mind, there's not that much difference between a student voucher which, and a per-student subsidy. And I'm perfectly comfortable with the idea of the right to, uh, right to Education Act saying that the government will finance the school directly on a per-student subsidy basis uh, so long as there's appropriate monitoring instruments in place to verify that the number of students that the school claims are coming uh, are in fact enrolled and, and attending on a, uh, on a regular basis. I think if that happens, then the basic the idea, the principle of funding following the student, uh, I think, which is the the core concept of a voucher, that you can you can retain that that principle. Um, so uh, I think, uh, in my own mind, that's a form of voucher because the child or the parent decide whether or not they want to go to this private school. Obviously, it's on a lottery basis, so it isn't only their decision, it's their choice, then defined by a lottery as to whether or not they're able to exercise that, that choice fully. Um, uh, so I think that that's, in, in a sense, that per student subsidy is, is almost the equivalent of a voucher, but but not quite, um, because it is driven by this lottery idea. I would be perfectly fine with the idea of, of providing instead a voucher to the student and they de or to the parent and they decide where to go, but I think from an implementation perspective at the kind of scale that, that the government is, is talking about, it might be very difficult to do that in the short term. I think over time uh, that, that they may evolve to that voucher system, uh, but I think just administratively uh, it's, it, it's more difficult to manage on an individual household basis than it will be in terms of just the administration dealing with whole schools because then you, you, you're able to take more of a wholesale approach as opposed to a retail approach. Well, certainly private schools uh, can help address the access issue because many of them either have underutilized capacity now, uh, seats that are available that are that are not being taken up, uh, and and I think government could take advantage of that underutilized capacity by through a public-private partnership model whereby they're, 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 they're financing on a per-student basis. I think also the incentives can be put in place to encourage private schools to expand their capacity. And if private schools knew that if they expanded their capacity and they could engage in a public-private partnership contract with the government where government said for the next 10 years, I will take 
fifty percent of your seats at such and such a unit cost, there would be an incentive for the private school to expand their capacity. So I think there's existing capacity. Private schools may also be incentivized to expand that capacity, addressing the quality issue, uh, the access issue. With respect to the quality issue, uh, here I think uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how this evolves with the right to education. I think right now, private schools are able to implement uh, perhaps a higher quality uh, service or offer a higher quality service, ironically because they're paying teachers less, which means they can hire more teachers, they can have a lower pupil-teacher ratio, uh, they can offer students more attention from the students there, uh, from the teachers, they're able to ensure that there's one teacher per class as opposed to putting teachers in a, in a, in a multi-grade, multi-class multi environment. So the fact that the, the actual market uh, wage for a qualified teacher is significantly below what the public school uh, teacher salary uh, is, that allows private schools to hire more teachers and offer, a, 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 I would say, in some respects, a better quality. So I think that's uh, what's, what's going to happen, though, with the Right to Education Act. If, indeed, all teachers, regardless of being public or private, have to have certain qualifications. Uh, there will be upward pressure on the private school salaries and some of that qualitative advantage might might erode. But but I, I don't think so. I think I, I, I don't think that market wage will will go up as high as, as the, the regular public school salary is, even even if uh, private schools have to ensure that all of their teachers uh, have, have certain uh, qualifications. Um, on the, uh, the other point was accountability and certainly private schools one of the great advantages they have is the accountability of their teachers. If their teachers don't show up for work they can be fired and uh, both uh, research and, and just uh, I think everyone's uh, basic experience with, with public schools is uh, if teachers don't show up for work in public schools it's very very difficult to sanction them or uh, to take any administrative measures against that uh, absenteeism. It, 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 it can happen but uh, I think the administrator who, who tries to take action uh, may find themselves uh, in a situation where the, the costs of trying to, uh, to uh, take administrative action uh, outweigh the benefits for that administrator. So there's a bit of a disincentive in there. My first focus would be on educating parents of government schools initially of what kind of learning they should expect from their schools. At the end of grade two, what should my child be able to do? Right? At the end of grade five, what should my child be able to do? At the end of grade eight, what should my child be able to do? Because I think too many parents, especially the parents of government schools, they may be aware of their right to send their child to school, but they aren't aware of what they should hold the school accountable for in terms of their child's learning. Obviously, the parent has a responsibility to support their child and to, and to ensure that they learn as well, but I don't think that parents of government schools are holding schools accountable, in part because they just don't know what they should expect from the school. So that would be the, the first thing is uh, a major public information or education campaign that that uh, has three maybe three levels grades two five and eight mm -hmm. at these levels here's a minimum learning level that that y y your child should be able to to meet and if and if they aren't meeting that you should be getting in, involved and engaged in, in how your school is uh, is operating because they aren't serving your child so that would be the first thing. Uh, I think the second thing uh, is just to uh, encourage more public debate about quality of, of learning and the focus has been on right to education and access to education and education for all. We aren't talking yet really about learning for all. 
and if India is going to be able to compete successfully in the 21st century and convert its demographic bulge into a dividend as opposed to a time bomb, children are going to have to be learning, not just attending uh, school.